In our modern society, we sometimes take the little things for granted. The things that make our own lives easier, and we never even think twice about it. An example of this is the radio. The radio has dramatically innovated every fact of life in America, including military, social, political, and economic standards. Without the radio, where would we get our information? Sure, there's always the internet or the television, but they aren't always the most viable solution for every situation. Say you're driving. You can't exactly look up traffic info or weather predictions on the internet, now can you? That's where the radio comes to the rescue. An infinite source of information for you, and it's all coming to you live and hands-free. Where did the radio get its start? Well, many inventors have been connected with the invention of the radio, but the man most think of is a Yugoslavian man by the name of Nikola Tesla. Born in July of 1856, Tesla began creating his own inventions as young as five years old. His first was in the form of a small water wheel, unlike which had been seen anywhere near where he had lived. His greatest invention is remembered as radio communication. Tesla's good friend, famous American writer Mark Twain, would often help him in his experiments. In an experiment in 1896, he succeeded in sending a message from a 5 kilowatt spark transmitter to a receiver 30 feet away. Thus, radio communication was born. Just when the radio began to gain large amateur and commercial use in the 1910s, all of that had to come to a halt on April 7, 1917. The United States had entered into World War I, and the Army needed all radio towers to be used for the war. Most private U.S. radio stations were ordered by President Woodrow Wilson to either shut down or be taken over by the government. During the war, it became illegal for private U.S. citizens to even possess an operational radio transmitter or receiver. Radio at this time became a government monopoly, reserved only for the war effort. Radio helped airplanes communicate with army bases and fellow aircraft. The radio innovated the way war could be fought and is still used today. The radio's golden years would live 10 years later, in the late 20s. Its experimental years were over, and it was making its way into the public. The most popular program format of the late 20s was a sponsored musical feature. It could be a large symphonic group, a dance orchestra, or a song and patter team, and would usually carry the sponsor's name. This is still shown nowadays, when a DJ will stop talking or playing music to say, A little shout out to our sponsor, Old Spice High Endurance, higher performance odor protection for late in the day. This is how radio stations now and back then made their money. Sponsors would pay them to announce their name during the show. Radio shows were a way to bring families together. Every night, a family would gather around the fire and listen to a radio show. Popular shows such as Rudy Valley and his Connecticut Yankees were extremely popular. Their shows would be played over the radio while the vast majority of Americans listened in. I built a railroad, now it's done. Brother, can you spare a dime? This practice would continue into the 1930s. The Great Depression was bearing down on families hard, and many people lost their jobs. The best way to bring up your mood would be to gather around the radio with your family and listen in. The radio is where people got their news and entertainment. Children like to listen to the radio with Little Orphan Annie, the brave detective child with a wild imagination, and Sandy, her pet dog, while trying to solve the mystery. Adults preferred to listen to shows such as Gone with the Wind. The most popular of these 30s radio shows had to have been Shirley Temple, who rose to fame in 1934 when she starred in Now and Forever, Little Miss Marker, and Bright Eyes. And the most cracker in my soup, monkeys and rabbits loop the loop. Gosh, oh gee, but I have fun swallowing animals one by one. It is your problem, my friends. Your problem no less than it is mine. Together, we cannot fail. Another person who took advantage of the radio in the 1930s was the President of the United States, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. With the Great Depression in full swing, millions of panicked citizens made mass withdrawals from the vast majority of banks in the country. This sent thousands of banks spiraling into closure. On March 12, 1933, President Roosevelt came onto the radio to discuss banking with the common citizen. He described how banking works and that people shouldn't be afraid of losing their money by depositing in banks. My friends, I want to talk for a few minutes with the people of the United States about banking. To talk with the comparatively few who understand the mechanics of banking 
but more particularly with the overwhelming majority of you who use banks for the making of deposits and the drawing of checks. First of all, let me state the simple fact that when you deposit money in a bank, the bank does not put the money into a safe deposit vault. It invests your money in many different forms of credit, in bonds, in commercial paper, in mortgages, and in many other kinds of loans. In other words, the bank puts your money to work to keep the wheels of industry and of agriculture turning round. This has become known as FDR's Fireside Chats. He would continue to innovate the way Americans learn their politics through 29 more of these Fireside Chats throughout his four years as President of the United States. on Mars are undoubtedly nothing more than severe volcanic disturbances on the surface Radio of the planet. Radio would continue to provide people with information, but sometimes it shouldn't have been taken literally. This was shown in 1938. A man by the name of Orson Welles was the head of a radio show called Mercury Theater on Air. Wells decided that he would have one of his writers rewrite the story of the famous book War of the Worlds to be transformed into a radio play. When Wells finally read the play to thousands of listeners over the radio, people were horrified when they heard this. What anything means. Wait a minute, something's happening. A humped shape is rising out of the pit. I can make out a small beam of light against a mirror. What's that? There's a jet of flame springing from that mirror and it leaps right at the advancing men. It strikes him head on. Lord, they're turning into flames. Now the whole field's caught up by the woods, the bars, the, the gas tank, tanks of the automobiles spreading everywhere. Coming this way now, about 20 yards to my right. Listeners panicked, believing that what was being described over the radio was real. Thousands of people called radio stations and police. Many people loaded up their cars and fled their homes. People were hysterical and thought that the end was near. Hours after the program had finally ended and listeners had realized that the Martian invasion was not real, the public was outraged and thought that Orson Welles had tried to fool them. The power of the radio was what actually fooled the listeners. So many people have gotten used to believing everything they heard on the radio without thinking twice. They learned that they were wrong the hard way. You ain't nothing but a hound dog the crying by the end of World War II, 95% of all homes had radios, but the television was quickly tearing down the radio as a main source of entertainment. At this point, radio stations began to shift to broadcasting mainly music. With the invention of the transistor radio, the device became portable. The growth of rock and roll music was what kept radio stations alive. Artists such as Elvis Presley were immensely popular at this time, so fans kept their radios around to listen to his music. With radio stations focusing mainly on music, they needed a new show to attract listeners. This is when the American Top 40 was created. Each week, host Casey Kasim would count down the Top 40 songs from the Billboard Hot 100 singles and play them on the air. Disco was at its peak around this time, so teenagers swarmed to their radios in an attempt to hear their favorite songs, and even some new ones. The American Top 40 is still on the air today, except the host is American Idol host Ryan Seacrest. The radio had been the main source for music for as long as people could remember, but all that was about to change. With its first broadcast in 1982, Music Television, or MTV, would claim the number one spot to listen to music. Teens could now listen to their music being performed in music videos along with listening to it. The videos shown on MTV were frequently juvenile, vulgar, tasteless, and violent, which delighted teenage viewers while offending their parents. In a sense, MTV had killed the radio star. In our modern society, radio has changed quite a bit from the large machine in the middle of the living room. Nowadays, radios have become more compact and portable. Car radios now broadcast in XM or satellite radio with little to no commercials. Websites on the internet such as Pandora Radio also provide music to listeners. Radio still has troubles with competition nowadays though. With the invention of the MP3 player, listeners can now have a library of their favorite songs and listen to whatever they want when they want. With all this aside, over the past century, the radio has dramatically innovated every fact of life in America, including military, social, political, and economic standards. <laughs>